Uh, hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, a, a London bank based pro European think tank. Um, I shall be speaking today to the chairman of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, um, about the aftermath and consequences of the elections last week. I think there are three topics that we want to cover um, Scotland, the Labour Party, and devolution. Uh, to start with Scotland, if we may. It's clear that the electorate in Scotland have given a mandate for a new referendum in the elections. And that's something that at the moment the British government has set its face against. Now, we know that this government doesn't always carry through on its intentions and promises. So it's entirely possible that at some point we will have an, an, a, a referendum. Uh, if we do, obviously there will be a, a number of cross currents within the Conservative Party some English nationalists saying, well, we'd be well, well read of the Scots. The others saying they ought to know their place and we ought to be having a referendum anyway. How do you think all that's going to pan out? Will we have a referendum? If so, when? Um, and who's going to win it? Well, I think the timing of a referendum will depend on the twin pressures that are on this government. Um, they are economic ones and they're also constitutional ones not just in Scotland, but also in Ireland. And I think the question really is whether um, it will be constitutional pressures, developments with the ongoing problems in Northern Ireland that could spill into uh, greater focus on Scotland's constitutional position and greater difficulty because of the international dimension in Northern Ireland uh, to resist such calls or whether it'll be economic difficulties related to Brexit, debt, and all the rest that will um, precipitate a further uh, increase in support for independence in Scotland. In particular, I think the crucial thing there is the position of sterling. If we were to have difficulties over the currency, if there was a credibility question over our sustainability of debt and therefore a further weakening of the currency, such as we had uh, late last year, um, then that could impact on opinion in Scotland because of among the economic arguments against independence, the position of the currency, the use of sterling or not, and it, therefore by implication, it's cr the credibility of a European option with the euro and things, um, is absolutely central. So I think it, it's a really a question of whether uh, it's the constitutional changes, principally in Ireland, that drives the timetable, or whether it's economic developments. Yeah, uh, an unfavourable economic background might make people in Scotland much more reluctant to take the risk of, um, uh, of cutting, uh, cutting the painter uh, and leaving the United Kingdom. Um, in the long term, do you regard Scottish independence as, uh, as inevitable or, or is it a 60-40 possibility or, or how do you see that? I think it is um, certainly 60-40. Um, I mean, these things can go on for a, a very long time. Um, but the real question is, it's not just Scotland. The issues that um, Scotland throw up are also issues that are clearly alive in Ireland, but also to a degree in Wales and also within England. And in some respects, the divisions within England, although they're not clearly defined as national differences, are greater than the differences between the whole of England and Scotland. I mean, if you look at, at economic measurements, social attitudes and things, um, there is a north-south divide, and in particular, uh, London and the and southeast and the rest of the country divide that is extremely significant. And these are all divisions that uh, economic difficulties uh, will put into ever sharper relief. And but, so uh, it's a question of how these inter interact, it seems to me. Yeah. Uh, over the coming months and perhaps even years, uh, there will clearly be skirmishes between London and Edinburgh about the legal and, and political position. Um, do you think that there, there is uh, a case are there people arguing a case in the Conservative Party and in government um, to have a, a rapid um, a referendum in Scotland uh, on the basis that, that that might well be winnable now after the rollout of the vaccine and particularly if there's a, a good economic background initially as a result of the recovery from Covid? I, I think there are indeed people who are arguing that and in particular among unionists in Scotland who see parallels with the Quebec story and believe that if they can 
win a, a second referendum that will sort of put the issue um, to bed, at least for a, a, a very long while. Uh, and the, also they believe that the problem with waiting is that the, the demographic profile of pro-independence uh, support in Scotland is very much towards the younger population. I mean, basically, um, if you're under 30, you have a 75% chance of favouring independence. So there are those arguments. However, I don't believe they will prevail for a moment because the fundamental problem with granting a referendum in Scotland is not the issue of Scotland itself. It is the knock-on effect for Brexit. The reason why English nationalists, who are essentially now dominant in the Conservative Party, wish to hold on to Scotland is not because they have any great affection for Scotland or any real understanding of the traditional view of the Union. It's because they know that to lose Scotland would probably torpedo Brexit. It would be such a critical collapse. And equally, um, and a more specific element of that is that to grant another referendum uh, for Scotland after only seven years or eight or nine years would set a precedent for having another referendum on the EU. And those are things which they cannot contemplate. Well, uh, I've said that there are, are some people in the Conservative Party um, who would be happy to lose Scotland, who wouldn't regard it as a loss at all. They would say that will make permanent Conservative rule in England. Um, and uh, uh, secondly, I, I don't think that uh, uh, those in the Conservative Party who are against the referendum in Scotland uh, are particularly bothered by the question of, of logic or consistency or coherence vis-a-vis -vis the Brexit um, referendum. Um, a, a cowed BBC and a courtier press um, makes it much easier for the Conservative Party to get away with that sort of thing. Uh, I, don't, I think you may be attributing a desire for coherence um, to them that isn't really there. Well, I mean, there are certainly very strong English nationalists um, who have been driving the Brexit and the Conservative agenda. Um, however, it's worth looking, for example, at the latest paper from Chatham House on the impact of Scottish independence on um, England's status in the world. I mean, that all the issues to do with uh, the nuclear deterrent, to do with um, soft power, to do with an image of success, I think it would be a major blow that I find it quite difficult to imagine um, the current political order in England surviving, but also because it is likely to be highly disruptive and chaotic, um, or the risk is that it would be highly disruptive and, and chaotic. And that is how it, uh, the knock-on effect for the divisions within England is the point, because I, I do think that at the moment there is no, uh, despite all the, the the, the differences in social attitudes and in economic performance and everything else, there is not really a sense of the North or a sense of the South or even a sense of London um, sufficient to support uh, a strong separatist or, or very strong aut autonomy supporting movement. Um, however, if Scotland were to go, that would in some way release the lid of that process. I mean, first probably in Wales, but then, I mm. mean, the real issue is, is what happens in the economic powerhouse of the United Kingdom, which is the southeast of England, the area which is going to suffer most of the impact from Brexit. Let's uh, talk, about that. Their economy Let's been talk about that later, if, if we may. Let's go on to talking about the Labour Party. Um, uh, these were poor results for the Labour Party, although not quite as bad as appeared to be the case uh, at, at first. Um, and equally, the Conservative Party found itself in a, a favourable position with the rollout of the vaccine, um, with, the da with the economic damage of Brexit so far being concealed by, by, by Covid. Um, it, Hartlepool was overstated in its importance. It was something that would have um, gone to the Labour Conservative Party in 2019 had there not been the intervention of the Brexit Party. Um, so the doom and gloom can be overdone as far as the Labour Party is concerned. But nevertheless, these mediocre results have triggered a bout of soul searching, some of it personal, some of it uh, ideological. Um, how far do you think the, the, the Labour Party's future is ideologically compromised as it's torn between various constituent groups of its traditional coalition? Or, or is it a, a problem of the personality and attitudes of, uh, of Starmer? Uh, who uh, clearly doesn't commend himself particularly well to the red wall seats, um, but hasn't yet made any breakthrough in, in London and the Southeast. 
Uh, how's that going to play out? Uh, will Brexit uh, economic problems come more to the fore? And ha will we be confronted with a, a more favorable background for Labour in six months' time? Well, I'm not sure about six months, but uh, the credibility of um, the Labour Party uh, could be transformed. Uh, it, the real issue is how long it takes for disappointment to bite in the north of England relative to the south of England, and whether it's possible for the Labour Party to essentially do in reverse the um, extraordinary bolt fast that the Conservative Party has achieved. And the fact that the Conservative Party has transformed itself from being a southern um, upper and middle class party to being a northern working class party proves that it could be done in reverse. It hasn't uh, transformed itself. It, it's added to its existing coalition. Well, it has not it's forth. not yet lost the other element of it, but it is clearly a coalition that is intrinsically um, unstable. And the fact that they have pulled this trick off largely because of Brexit um, means that it is conceivable that a, a similar trick could be pulled off by, by the Labour Party if the promises upon which that trick of Johnson's has been achieved um, prove to be of no value. If, and, that's the is, and the question is how quickly that disappointment comes. I mean, in my view, it is obvious that uh, the levelling up agenda is economically impossible because what is... Um, being attempted here is to spend a very large amount of money uh, in the north, raised from the south, but actually raised by debt, um, and from a south that is less able to uh, fund that because its economy has been damaged by Brexit, in essence. And that you're, cannot you're, continue. You're saying it's not merely economically impossible, but politically impossible as well. I think so too, yes, because as soon as the full impact of higher taxation, debt, the um, economic difficulties related to Brexit, particularly in, in crucial industries like financial services, as soon as those bite, uh, then um, Johnson's loss of support in the former conservative heartlands of the South will accelerate. I mean, already in these elections, we've seen some early indications of that. The conservative underperformance in the home counties, for example, is quite striking. Um, but the beneficiaries um, of that were the Liberal Democrats, at least as much as the Labour Party, weren't they? Indeed. Um, and it may well be that the only way forward for the Labour Party is to forge some form of pact or alliance with the Liberal Democrats um, going forward. And, and those are the, the, the problems that have been around for a long time, the, the structural division of the opposition to the Conservative Party. And the Conservative Party's superior capacity to hold on to its um, increasingly stretched coalition. But um, the, the idea, British politics has become very, very fluid now. But will and that fluidity really lead to a progressive alliance? Isn't the Labour Party in particular rather too tribal for such, a, for such an outcome? The Greens would find it very difficult to participate in such an the alliance. The problem is that it is difficult to imagine the circumstances coming about, um, which would allow a complete reversal of the current position um, within this parliament. Um, but I think that such, a, that such a reversal is possible is demonstrated by the fact that the Conservatives have achieved this extraordinary transformation um, already. And that the, the, the former roots of British politics have been ripped up and that creates a very fluid position. Um, but it, there may indeed be other forces that emerge. I mean, it is possible to imagine that um, the demonstration that the Scottish nationalists have had, that under the first past the post electoral system, if you control a strong regional nation in their case, um, you can actually um, gain the system to your advantage. That lesson could also be true in the South. Um, and around London. I mean, will there be a voice for those who are losers from the current um, economic development? When you uh, talk about nations and regions, um, the great advantage that the SNP had 
is that there is already a, a national identity there, which up till now has been accommodated within the United Kingdom. Uh, is it going to be possible to, to, to see the evolution coming into being uh, of regional identities in England, other than possibly London? Well, I think that's one of the reasons why Scottish independence is potentially such an important issue, because I think it will give credibility to um, that notion. Um, already the, the real differences on the ground, if you look at economic performance, social attitudes and the rest between certainly London and the Southeast and the rest of the country, particularly the North, are greater than the differences between the whole of the United Kingdom, the whole of England and, and Wales and Scotland. Um, but you're right, there is as yet no strong identity to give political support for that. But if Scotland were to achieve independence, I think that would transform the whole debate. Um, but it would also transform the whole debate um, in, in, a, in a more general sense. It might allow um, a, a federal um, Britain to emerge and rejoin the EU. I mean, it, it would throw that the, the, the Scottish pressure is very destructive of the current order, even if it doesn't go so far as to actually achieve independence. And in that sense, the, the longer this sort of pot boils of Scottish um, discontent, of Scottish national sentiment, of Scottish disenchantment with the United Kingdom, the more corrosive it becomes on England. Mentioned or, or have been hinting about the idea of a, a federal UK, um, a federal England. Um, there's the beginnings, it seems to me, of a debate even on the right of the political spectrum, uh, about the idea of a, a federal United Kingdom. Uh, and there are some people who think that a federal United Kingdom would be uh, a good uh, way of, of preventing, or at least um, making less likely Scottish independence. So there's the beginnings of a debate about a federal Britain there. But, but I'm wondering how serious this debate is and how far it's going to be able to go. Um, what about the centralizing tendencies of, of, um, of this particular government? Um, what about the, the difficulties we've already been talking about of, of evolving a, a regional identity? Um, do you think we're going to live in a federal Britain anytime soon? And if so, um, how would it be structured? Would it be um, a federal England as well as a, a federal Scotland, a federal Ireland, of course, might be a possibility in the, in the medium term future? Well, I think the, the problem is that um, this government is set against any form of uh, devolution in England, certainly, and of granting any further powers to Scotland or Wales, and maybe even um, to restoring direct rule to Northern Ireland if, uh, in the current uh, situation, Stormont fails. Um, and they believe that devolution is actually spurred the fissiparious uh, features in uh, the United Kingdom structure and th therefore are set, are set against doing so. Um, and I also don't think that in the short run, further concessions on devolution, even if they were to be forthcoming from this government, um, would actually change very much the debate in Scotland. I think they're past the point where further promises of devolution would certainly head off a, a, another referendum. I think if another referendum were held and it was still won by unionists, then perhaps um, a federal order might be uh, conceivable, but, but not before then. What do you think the Labour Party's attitude to these questions is going to be? Because um, two of the main successes of, um, uh, of the Labour Party in the recent elections in Manchester and in, uh, in Wales and to, just to some extent in London, um, came in the devolved administrations where Labour had a certain record where they could be viewed favourably, obviously, by the electorate on the basis of, 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 that, of that record. Um, do you think that will encourage the Labour Party to, to become more um, constitutionally innovative than it has been until now? There is supposed to be a review of this and, and other issues. Um, how do you think that's going to play out? I certainly think the Labour Party would be well advised to pursue this line, particularly... The well, they take your good advice, though. Uh, um, well, uh, <laughs> um, I think they might, because um, I, I mean, it, it does depend slightly on, on, on how the Conservatives um, structure this, because although they are set against 
um, further devolution. They will nevertheless be seeking to build up a number of figures in the north of England um, who will be in receipt of particular largesse. And um, the, the Teesside um, uh, mayoralty, for example, is, is, is one that comes to mind. Um, but I think that actually in addressing the red wall cultural problem that the Labour Party has, going for further devolution is actually a very good means of, of um, beginning down that path. But it's not something that is going to um, be a quick fix. I mean, this is the problem that um, any disappointment in the North, any um, sense that the conservative promises are not being fulfilled will take some time to come through. And the Labour Party must be haunted by the thought that uh, the same processes are underway in the North, perhaps, as were in Scotland when they lost to the SNP. Um, their, their grip on Scotland, and they've never recovered it. And um, so uh, I think that is something which would encourage them probably uh, to pursue more devolution if they were confident of, of keeping control of it. But if, if, of course, the effect of more devolution in the North was to create a distinctly Northern political force, that would be a different matter. There's been some talk of um, these elections having been so positive for the Conservative Party um, that Johnson and others are giving thought to a, to a general election in the not too distant future. Do you think there's any chance of that? Or would that be a misreading of, uh, of what's happened over the past few days? Um, I think clearly there is, there is a temptation. There is always a temptation in particular because um, there is a realization that uh, the economic difficulties from COVID and above all from Brexit are still to come and are going to be very savage. And the idea of being able to restore their, uh, their grip, get an extension of their grip on, on England um, before those factors hit is great, but I can't see how they could really justify that. I think it would be, um, in particular, I think the danger would be that the markets would read it as a sign of real fear about how serious those problems are going to be. And so such a strategy could backfire very seriously. And there's no question the temptation is there, but I would be surprised at the end of the day that it, that it would actually materialise. Well, I think we've raised many more questions than we've provided answers, um, but then <laughs> that's always the way in politics. There's never a final answer until it's too late to realise what's happened. Um, thank you very much indeed, and uh, let's look forward to a, a similar dialogue in future.